It's great to welcome back to the program. Michael Moss, a New York Times bestselling author, wrote the book Salt, Sugar, Fat. New book out today is Hooked Food, Free Will and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions. Uh, so great to have you back, Michael. Hey, nice to see you again, David. So in the time since we last spoke, we've learned a lot more about the sort of physically addictive nature of certain food elements. We've learned about sugar. We've we've learned about other elements, but we've also learned a lot about um, food marketing, nutritionism and so many other aspects that that operate on a more sort of psychological rather than physical level. Talk a little bit about sort of your general approach to this book and, and what you're talking about when you talk about um, addiction to food. Yeah. So, I mean, I wrote the book and I started researching it because right after salt, sugar, fat came out, I, you know, at the end of it, I was trying to be a little optimistic and say, look, ultimately, we're the ones who decide what to eat and how much. And the very first question I got was, but Michael, isn't this stuff you're writing about addictive like drugs? And if so, how can we have any control over it? And I was like, whoa, you mean you're comparing like Twinkies to heroin? I mean, I was like, no way. But I came full circle in realizing and talking to experts who coached me on this, which is that, look, in some ways, food is even more addictive than some drugs. And part of the reason for that is that the companies have figured out ways to tap into, exploit, if you will, our basic instincts. I mean, we by nature are drawn not just to eat, but to overeat. And the companies have figured that out and turned that, which was a good thing for most of our existence, into a really treacherous thing by making overeating an everyday thing. Is um, what is the start of the chain of all of this? Is it profit motive for food giants? Yeah, I mean, look, I still don't see this as this evil empire that intentionally set out to to make us overweight or, or otherwise ill. These are companies doing what all companies want to do, make as much money as possible by selling as much product as possible, and by making that product as attractive and irresistible as, as possible. So they have chemists working for them. They have marketing experts, psychologists, sort of all trained and focused on hitting our biological instincts, but also our emotional buttons to maximize the allure of their products. Can you talk a little bit about what 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 exactly is it when you research this that that is most addictive? Is it, as sometimes said, yeah. you know, the dopamine release from sugar is similar to drugs? Is it what what exactly is it? Yeah. So there's a few things. One, we are built to sort of love food that's inexpensive. It kind of makes sense, right? The least put out the least amount of energy for the calories that you're getting. You know, the industry uses these chemical labs to come up with new formulations that are shaving, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents off the price of a package that excites the brain. Um, they're really good at variety. You know, we're, we by instinct are drawn toward different kinds of food. That's why we're able to populate different parts of the world with different food to eat. And we're really good at adjusting to that. You know, you walk in the cereal aisle of the grocery store there are 200 versions of sugary starch with that sole par purpose of exciting the brain. Um, we love calories, right? We have sensors in our gut, also possibly in our mouth, that detect calories in food. And so the food companies have been really good about packing in the calories. I mean, compare like a hot pocket to a stick of celery and you get the idea of the contrast between basic food stuff and ultra processed foods. And again, the brain, the brain gets really excited by the more calories and is much more apt to sort of put you into that impulsive, compulsive drive where the thinking part of your brain doesn't have a chance to, 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 to step up and say, hey, wait a minute, Michael, I think you're going too hard on this food. It seems that at a certain point there was a huge evolutionary evolutionary advantage to that in the sense that like if you think back to uh, hunter gathering and the amount of time and energy spent chewing in order to obtain a certain number of calories. And then yeah. all of a sudden you're maybe able to, you know, you, you cook something and you're so which allows you to kind of do in advance some of the work that your teeth and body would do. 
the body probably would sense that, wow, one bite of this is conferring way more calories. And it, it was good at a certain point. It was such an eye opener to me, spending time with evolutionary biologists, one of whom kind of pointed out to me, look, Michael, it's not so much that food is addictive. It's that we by nature are drawn to eating and the companies have changed the nature of our food. Um, you know, you, you said it absolutely. Body fat was a really good thing. It enabled our brains to grow, enabled us to get through hard times, enabled us to have more babies which natural selection is, is all about. And it's only in the last 50 years that we're sort of realizing that having too much body fat will work against you. I had no idea, but body fat is a living thinking organ. And when you try to reduce the amount of fat on your body, it will fight back in incredibly diabolical ways. It will send signals to the brain that you're hungry when you're not hungry. It will slow down your metabolism it will make you get more excited when you see advertising for processed food and cause you to want that food more than you did before you had that extra weight. One of the things that uh, Michael Pollan writes about in Omnivore's Dilemma is the sort of transformation by food companies of foods into food products, taking, for example, the idea of like if you just take corn it's tough to make a lot more money just selling corn. Maybe you can get a seed that can be planted more densely so you can sort of like up how much you can grow in an acre. But like selling corn as corn is only going to get you so far. However, if you take corn, break it down into its component parts, you can now use corn syrup as, a, as an alternative to sugar. You're adding calories and reducing cost and you're extracting and taking all these different elements. Most people, if they looked at a list of ingredients, would recognize a lot of that stuff is highly processed and probably not that good for you. And yet these products are all incredibly popular. So so what are food companies doing in order to make people want products that if you're really presented with the ingredient list, most people probably know aren't really the best things to be eating? Yeah, I think one of the most important things they're doing is speed. I learned from researchers who study drug addiction, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, or, or harder narcotics, that the hallmark of addiction is how fast the substance hits the brain. Because the faster it gets in our brain, the more apt we are to hit that go button and not respond to the smaller part of the brain that's trying to put the brakes on you know, us doing something we really don't want to be doing. Um, and so the food companies were ingenious in building speed into their products both in the factory to reduce the cost, but also just the way we eat it. And I, I often refer to these foods as convenience foods because a lot of them can be eaten with one hand while you're doing something else. And right. that creates this mindlessness mode um, where you're not paying attention to the food. And when you're not paying attention to their products, they're controlling you rather than you controlling them. So speed is, speed is probably the most important and most diabolical aspect of these ultra processed foods. How does all of this apply to uh, the sort of diets, sometimes sometimes fa called fad diets, lifestyle diets that sometimes will come in and out of favor uh, in, in large part because of marketing, when it seems that over time, if you take a big picture view, you don't really seem to need anything so specialized. It seems that sort of uh, uh, limiting processed foods is a good thing generally li uh, uh, limiting, uh, but not necessarily completely eliminating animal products isn't a bad thing. To me, I see profit opportunities anytime you see a diet that requires a lot of one thing or none of another uh, is is my my instinct right on that? Well, absolutely. I mean, let me tell you about sort of profit. I was stunned to learn that the largest processed food manufacturers quietly bought up, gained control over some of our more popular dieting methods, and we're talking about Heinz buying Weight Watchers, um, Slim Fast. Atkins, um, you name it, South Beach Diet. A lot of these brands and methods were acquired, none other than by the food companies. And then they kind of populated the grocery store with diet versions of their mainline products, which really weren't all that different 
than the full bore calorie version sitting next to each other on the shelf and sort of counting on us to be making rational decisions every time we go shopping as to which of these products to 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 buy and 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 eat and and pay attention to but here's the thing again that sort of relates to that relates to addiction um the thing about and one of the lessons from drug addiction one of the things that makes these food products even more troublesome than drugs can be which is that you can't just go cold turkey you can't just stop eating to deal with a food eating problem we all have to eat and that's a slippery slope. And so we walk into the grocery store and we're so vulnerable at times in our lives or times of the, of the, of the day to their marketing and their products and these diet schemes that look by and large work until they stop working, which is why so many people have trouble sticking to a diet because it's strange and it's different. And they ultimately, because the power of memory and, and, and in shaping our eating habits draws us back to what we were doing before. Is the, uh, I mean, you know, most people, most people are busy. People are working. People are earning a living. They have to get their kids back and forth. It can be very difficult to keep up with. Is the egg good or bad right now? Is coffee good or bad? Is soy good or bad? That is, is there one principle which is just avoid processed foods as much as possible? That is the simplest thing for people to remember, or or, or would it be something else? I think it kind of depends where you are on the spectrum. Look, I wrote this book for everybody, whether you're in an eating disorder with binging or you've got clinical obesity or you're at the other end where you're just kind of like troubled by like how much attention you have to pay to food to stay on top of it and not let it like, you know, gain control of, of your of your life. And I think the overall lesson, I think, again, a lesson learned from the drug addiction world is that it really helps to have a plan, no matter what it is, but to have that plan and then execute it. So, you know, if you're hit by the proverbial 3 p.m. craving for a cookie, what you learn from people who've helped people deal with drug addiction is you've got to like at 255, you need to be working on your, your plan, whether that involves getting up and stretching or calling a friend or having an alternative snack like a handful of nuts in order to ward off that craving because, because those cravings come on so fast that no amount of willpower is going to help you resist them once they hit the reward center of the brain. So that that pre-thought, no matter kind of what your strategy is, I think is, is the overall lesson I learned in, in talking to, to other uh, to addiction researchers. In terms of now, uh, all of the sugar alternatives, you know, sweetened with beet sugar, sweetened with monk fruit or whatever the case may be, um, it, uh, is, it, is that really about health or is it about profitability or is it both? The companies are in this mode now where more and more of us are caring about what we put in our bodies and responding to that by eating less of their most problematic products. The companies are responding by cutting back on salt, sugar, fat, but also adding things um, to their products like protein or fiber, you know, on the notion that that might help reduce the cravings we get for those products. Sugar is really interesting to me, and I'm, you know, and and the science is still new on this, and 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 I wouldn't, and I wouldn't bet on it at this point. But there is concern that this move by the industry to replace, reduce sugar by replacing it with fake non-caloric sweeteners could be really problematic. I mean, think about it. You know, you taste something sweet, your brain is expecting calories, but your gut doesn't get those calories. You know, it's quite possible that something will go haywire with your metabolism. So, I mean, if you're using a diet soda to really resist, you know, drinking a full calorie soda and that works for you, you know, nutrition was to say, OK, go for it. But overall, I think it's really troubling that the companies are moving around the entire grocery store now trying to reduce the sugar level, but keeping that sweetness by using these sweet, sweet, fake sweeteners, non-caloric ones, 
without us knowing enough about the science to be really confident in how that's going to work in our bodies. Well, that that seems to be the crux of, of the sort of nutritionism approach that you can you can essentially break a food down to a certain number of calories, grams of fat, uh, um, a, amount of vitamin C or whatever. And what what you would sort of get to is a pill that has the same statistics as broccoli and assuming that it will do the same thing for you when the whole food really has something to it that may be beyond mathematical identification, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I think that's so perspective and I mean, perceptive of you. And, I, and, I, and I'll tell you a story in that, you know, the you know, the nutrition facts box on products, the label to say that fine yeah. print on the back of the label. Not all of us can, you know, read it or even understand it. Right. I had no idea that that fact box was the creation of none other than the processed food industry right. as a way of warding off our concerns about their products. Because in some ways, one of our basic instincts, too, is to love information and kind of be placated. One scientist calls us infovores. And, and, the, the, and the reality is when we turn to that fax box and try to like parse out these nutrient parts of this food that isn't really food anyway in the totality, we get lulled into thinking all that data must be really great and this is okay for us to eat. But the nutrition facts box is 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 a bit of treachery in and of itself. No, uh, no, no question about it. The new book out today is hooked food, free will and how the food giants exploit our addictions. We've been speaking with the book's author, Michael Moss. Michael, always a pleasure speaking to you. Great to see you and talk to you, too, David.